أناج الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى أناج الحق في ليل لهي من أصدق النجوى وأدعو الله من قلب سليم يطلب التقوى Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum and welcome to Perspective on ITV. My name is Faisal Patel and today in studio I am honored to have Zafar Bankash. He is a noted Islamic movement journalist and commentator in Toronto, Canada. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Perspective. Wa alaikum salam. It's a pleasure. Okay. Safar is also the director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought and president of the Islamic Society of York Region, which is a suburb of Toronto. He is imam at the Islamic Society of York Region's Masjid and Community Center in Richmond Hill, Ontario. He is also the editor of the Crescent International News Magazine and trustee and formerly former assistant director of the Muslim Institute London, where he worked with the late Dr. Kalim Siddiqui, the founder of the Muslim Institute and leader of the Muslim Parliament of Great Britain. Bangash is also co-founder of the Muslim Unity Group. He is best known for his commentaries, current affairs as editor of the Crescent International and continues as columnist and contributor to Crescent. Now, in the previous show, uh, obviously, we have discussed the main, a lot of issues, and today we're going to expound on some of those issues and touching on the different regions of the world. And one of those regions that we want to talk about is the United States. Now, uh, Zafar, in, uh, you, know, you refer to Barack Obama as that black man in the White House and the perfect Uncle Tom. Now, a lot of people have deemed this statement as racist. Um, I want you to you know, clarify the statement you made and why do you refer to Obama in this particular manner? Sure. You see, uh, Barack Obama uh, may have uh, a dark skin, uh, but his life experience is not that of an African-American uh, whom I have interacted with in the U.S. for decades. Uh, Barack Obama's entire life experience has been in a white environment. So we actually refer to him as an Oreo cookie, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is um, black on the outside, the chocolate, and inside it has white cream in it. That's basically what Barack Obama is, that his skin color may be dark, but his mentality is that of a uh, white racist American. Uh, and you can see even from his um, attitude towards uh, the African-American community in the U.S., that their plight has not increased, it has not, uh, their plight has not improved, uh, their condition has not uh, become any better under uh, Obama uh, than it was under any of his uh, predecessors. So when we refer to Barack Obama as that black man in the White House, yeah. what we are really saying is, that this man is uh, simply continuing and pursuing the same policies that his predecessors pursued. In fact, in some instances, he has even back on his promises. Like, you know, just to give you a quick example, uh, in uh, January of 2009, when Barack Obama was uh, sworn in as President of the United States, this was in his first term, <clears throat> the very next day, he not only issued a statement but he issued an executive order in which he said that Guantanamo Bay, that torture chamber in, in, in the illegally occupied Cuban island, yeah. would be closed within one year. Yeah. And he said that Guantanamo Bay is a stain on our honor and that it is damaging our interests around the world. Now, that was in January of 2009. Yes. Now we are in January of 2014. Five years later, Guantanamo Bay is still there. People are still t being tortured over there. There are about 166 people held over there, of whom at least 86 have already been declared totally innocent by the Pentagon. Yes. And yet, these, and this, this happened not uh, today, this happened about three years ago, and yet these 86 people are still languishing in Guantanamo Bay. People are still being tortured over there. So... Why are these innocent people being held over there? Why were they arrested in the first place? Why is America continuing to act as an outlaw nation rather than a, a country that abides by the rule of law? 
the Americans constantly talk about, you know, this shining example on the hill and they want to deliver democracy to the rest of the world, but they have a funny way of delivering democracy using cruise missiles or B-52 bombers, mm -hmm. and they keep on, you know, incarcerating these innocent people. So we uh, commented on Obama's policies and said that uh, he is no different than his predecessors, he's pursuing their, continuing their policies, and since he's pandering to the, the American establishment, that's why we refer to him as an Uncle Tom. He's not standing for the rights of the ordinary people, whether it's white or black people. Incidentally, there are 44 million Americans that are living in absolute poverty, mm -hmm. according to the U.S.'s own statistics. Mm -hmm. 40 million children in America do not have medical uh, coverage. The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. 2.2 million Americans are in prison. Mm -hmm. It costs the U.S. government $50 billion a year to keep 2.2 million people in prison. If you were to hand out this $50 billion to the American people, to the poor people, he would solve a lot of his problems. Mm -hmm. And yet, the vast majority of the people in U.S. prisons are African Americans. Mm -hmm. So what kind of a, a president is it that he keeps his own people in prison <laughs> and, and the justice system is totally opposed to them and against them? And yet he has absolutely no concern for them. Now, I want to, I don't know if you're a fan of Boston Legal. Um, I'm, I'm a total fan of Boston Legal. And one of the cases that a particular attorney, Alan Shaw, it's a fictional character, but the cases are particularly real. He says, and I want to quote, he says, when the weapons of mass destruction thing turned out not to be true, I expected the American people to rise up. They didn't. Then when Abu Ghraib torture thing surfaced and it was revealed that our government participated in rendition, a practice where we kidnap people and turn them over to, to regimes that specialize in torture, I was sure that American people would be heard from. We stood mute. Then came the news that a jail thousands of terrorists suspected, locked them up without the right to trial or even the right to confront the accuser. Certainly, we would never stand for that. We did. Now, the whole quote goes on. But do you think that the sentiments... Of, or the, the actions of Barack Obama are shared by the American people, or do they, in their own way, oppose his actions uh, against the world? Actually, as far as the American people are concerned, I wouldn't say that they share uh, Obama's policies or his sentiments. The tragedy is that the vast majority of the people in the United States are kept in such ignorance by the kind of nonsense that is dished out to them by Fox News or other TV channels yes. in the U.S. that the American people often do not even know what the reality is. Uh, in fact, even in terms of uh, their other policies of education, Americans tend to be very, very ignorant people. Like, you know, they did uh, a few years ago, there was a survey done of American undergraduates yes. to find out that they should name the country that was a neighbor of the United States. And do you know that 38% of American university undergraduates said France was a neighbor of the United States? I mean, you would think, for God's sake, you, you have got universities, you, you call yourselves the leading power in the world and, you know, scientific research, etc. And 38% of your undergraduates don't even know who your neighbors are. What would they know about the rest of the world? Yeah, so, true. unfortunately... The, the vast majority of the American people, if they knew the facts, if they knew the truth, they would react differently. Mm -hmm. Although, un again, unfortunately, uh, this tends to be perhaps uh, human nature that if it doesn't affect you personally, then you say, ah, it's bad, but then you just you know, shrug your shoulders and walk Absolutely. away. And unfortunately, that's what's happening in the U.S. <laughs> okay. I want to move away from America a little bit. I think uh, it's a bit sickening that uh, America is at the center of such atrocities. In another of your articles, uh, I Love Kashmir, you write, Contrary to popular misunderstanding, Kashmir is not a territorial dispute between India and Pakistan, but about the right of the Kashmiris to determine their own future. Now, what is the current situation in Kashmir, and how did Kashmir dispute arise? It's a very good question, and I'm very glad that you raised it because um, Kashmir dispute is very close to my heart, uh, particularly the suffering of the Kashmiri people. They have suffered terrible, terrible atrocities at the hands of the Indian Occupation Army. Incidentally, India has 700,000 troops in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. It is the most militarized region in the world. Now, basically... The, the Kashmir dispute arose uh, because when India and Pakistan came into existence in 1947, 
it was the partition plan was done on the basis that wherever there are Muslim majority areas, that would form a part of Pakistan, and Hindu majority areas would be part of India. Now, there were some princely states, Kashmir being one of them, which is an overwhelmingly Muslim majority state, yes. they, by sort of political trickery, not only India, but also um, Mountbatten, who was the last governor general of India and a British uh, viceroy, he manipulated the situation, and Kashmir was, most of Kashmir was uh, basically occupied by India. Yeah. There are several United Nations Security Council resolutions. These are Security Council resolutions dating from beginning of 1948 till about 1957 that consistently call for a referendum in Kashmir. And unfortunately, India initially said, yes, we abide by it, we will honor this. But then when they tightened their grip on yeah. Kashmir, then they started backing out of it. Just, you're going to have to hold it, though. We're just going to have to go for a break. Uh, we're speaking to Zafar Bangash. He's a journalist from Toronto in Canada. Uh, and we're talking about Kashmir. So we're going to go for a break. And when we return, we're just going to expound on that issue. Uh, I think Kashmir has been sidelined for a while, while the world concentrates on other issues in other areas like Iran and Pakistan and and all the other areas, but when we return, we'll expound more a little on Kashmir. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Perspective. My name is Faisal Patel. This evening we're speaking to Safar Bangash. He's a noted Islamic movement journalist and commentator in Toronto, Canada. You're welcome to interact with me by sending me a mail on faisal at itvnetworks.tv. Alternatively, send me a tweet on at faisy143 or drop me a comment on facebook.com forward slash Faisal Patel. Before the break, we were speaking about the Kashmiri issue. Like I mentioned, it has been sidelined. A lot of people hasn't been talking about it. Um, you know, a lot of people have been focusing on the Israeli issue, the Palestinian issue, on the atrocities of America, Iran, Iraq, and a whole lot of other issues that's plaguing the Muslim world at the moment. Now, uh, Zafar, before the break, um, we were speaking about the Kashmiri issue. Uh, just quickly, um, to elaborate on that point we were discussing before the break, how do, we dis how do we resolve the Kashmiri issue and how do we educate uh, the world on what the actual dispute of, of the Kashmiri people are? You see, the uh, Kashmir dispute, as I mentioned, is enshrined in several United Nations Security Council resolutions that call for holding a referendum in Kashmir to determine the wishes of the Kashmiri people. Yes. India had agreed to it. Pakistan has agreed to it. It's on the UN statute books. It remains alive. That's the first thing. Since 1989, the people of Kashmir have risen up that's under Indian occupation, that, that part. There is another part which is called Azad Kashmir or Free Kashmir that is part of Pakistan. In the Indian occupied Kashmir, people have risen up, in 90, they rose up in 1989 and to the present time, more than 100,000 people have been killed by the Indian occupation army. Mm -hmm. Number two, at least uh, 10 to 15,000 people have simply disappeared. Nobody knows where they have gone to. People picked up from their homes and the Indian army just takes them away. More than 10,000 Kashmiri women have been raped by the Indian Occupation Army. It's a disgrace when you think about it. It's mind-boggling that, you know, these kinds of atrocities would occur in the 20th and 21st centuries, and not one Indian soldier has so far been punished for these egregious, horrible crimes. The solution is very simple. There is a UN Security Council resolution, not one, several. There should be a, an internationally supervised referendum in Kashmir to to determine whether the people of Kashmir want to be part of India or they want to be part of Pakistan. Right. As simple as that. And India that claims to be the world's largest democracy, it is afraid of the most democratic process of a referendum. Absolutely. That's where the problem oh, is. Yes. Unfortunately, you know, I'm, I was just thinking now this, the show is so short and we have a plethora of issues around the world that we need to tackle. and. I don't think 30 minutes will actually cut it. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, you have also written that unless the U.S. and Israel uh, realize that their murderous policies, far from cowing the Muslims, will uh, uh, only intensify hatred for them, there will be a peace neither in the Muslim world nor for the U.S. and its Zionist surrogate Israel. Now, also in the week, um, 
last week, Saturday, um, is Israeli, uh, former Israeli president, Ariel Sharon, passed away. He was known as a butcher of Sabra and Shatila. Given the question that I ask, um, what are your thoughts and comments on, on this particular issue? <clears throat> I'm glad that you, you touched on uh, Ariel Sharon's uh, death. Uh, he was the former prime minister and he had been in coma since January of 2006. So he basically remained in a, in a vegetative state for eight years. Perhaps, I mean, I personally looked at it as perhaps a divine retribution mm -hmm. in this world for the crimes that he had committed against innocent people. Yeah. You know, Sharon has done so many terrible crimes uh, right at the beginning, in the early part of Israeli history, uh, he was responsible for the massacre at Kibya, a Jordanian village. Uh, scores of Palestinian and Jordanian civilians were slaughtered. In 1956, it is documented that uh, thousands of uh, Egyptian soldiers had surrendered to the Israeli army in the Sinai Peninsula, and Sharon ordered their execution. That's a war crime to, to kill soldiers that have already surrendered, dropped their weapons, and you have them killed. Sharon was the mastermind of the invasion of Lebanon in June of 1982, in which about 18 to 20,000 Palestinians were slaughtered. And then he allowed the phalanges, it's a vicious militia in Lebanon, uh, that were allowed into the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. And for three days, from September the 12th to September the 14th, they went around massacring, slaughtering Palestinian men, women, and children. They even didn't spare their animals, like horses and cows and goats, even killed them. And so at the end of that, when in fact uh, this came to the international attention, there was a, a great uh, sort of demands about um, justice against these terrible crimes that Israel had actually facilitated. Israel set up a, a commission of inquiry under Justice Kahan. And Justice Kahan said that Sharon is culpable, indirectly culpable for the massacres in Sabra and Shatila. Yeah. And yet, although at that time he resigned, as defense minister, but a few years later he came back and he actually was elected prime, prime minister in 2001, in March of 2001. And in fact, prior to that, in September of 2000, Sharon had gone in a very provocative way onto the compound, the holy compound of Masjid al-Aqsa. And that, in fact, led to the second intifada in Palestine, which again resulted in thousands of Palestinians yes. getting killed. Yes. Sharon was also the mastermind of the separation wall, which has been dubbed as the apartheid wall, and the International Criminal Court or International Court of Justice has declared that wall illegal. Sharon was also the mastermind of the settlement policy. So whichever way you look at it, that man did terrible things to the Palestinians, all kinds of horrible crimes that he perpetrated, my only regret at his death is that he did, was not hauled before the International Criminal Court to be tried as a war criminal mm -hmm. and to answer for his misdeeds. Quick escape, but right? unfortunately, he got, but I hope that, you know, we believe in, in a just Lord and just uh, God Almighty that he will now deal with him and, and make him hold, uh, hold him accountable for his uh, horrible crimes on the face of this earth. Right. Now, moving further afield, uh, coming on to Iran, uh, in this week, last week, uh, the White House confirmed on Sunday last week that uh, nuclear agreement with Iran will take effect from January 20th, which is uh, this coming week or the following week. But President Barack Obama said that he was under no illusions, you know, uh, in inverted commas, how hard it would be to reach a comprehensive resolution. Your comments on this briefly? Sure. <clears throat> you see, on November 24th of 2013, Iran and the uh, six powers uh, signed an interim agreement under which uh, Iran agreed to not only cap its nuclear activities, but also to suspend some of its nuclear activities. I want to emphasize that whatever Iran was doing or has been doing in, the, in terms of its nuclear program, it is entirely legal. It is under the Non-Proliferation -Pro Treaty, uh, and Iran has done absolutely nothing illegal. It is not making a bomb. It has, never, it has never had any intentions of making a bomb. So whatever Iran has been doing in the nuclear field is its legitimate right. Uh, but of course, the West was constantly making allegations against Iran because the U.S. wanted to uh, basically force Iran to surrender its rights. 
um, and the, the the current agreement that um, that uh, has now been reached, which was signed on November 24th, but some technical modalities had to be worked out. It, the, these modalities are now going to be implemented from January the 20th. This is what the agreement says. Yeah. So when those um, uh, technical modalities were worked out, now the implementation stage comes. So Iran agreeing to certain of the conditions of uh, suspending parts of its nuclear program in return, the U.S. would release some of the frozen assets of Iran. There are more than $100 billion worth of oil revenue that has been frozen. But the U.S. has said under this deal to release about $7.5 billion and also allow uh, importation of medicines because millions of Iranians are suffering as a consequence of lack of medicines and other essential uh, commodities for, for instance, uh, civilian aircrafts, etc. So I believe that if uh, both parties are sincere in arriving at a solution to this problem, I don't think that there is any, any, there will be any problem. But regrettably, mm -hmm. the U.S. itself is not sincere because, yeah. you know, even when this agreement was signed and the U.S. said, okay, we are not going to impose any more sanctions, uh, the Congress is now pushing for other resolution to impose new sanctions on Iran. I can say if more sanctions are imposed, this deal would be off, nothing would come off it. But at least Iran has now um, challenged the U.S. to prove its sincerity in, in what it is saying, because Iran has been transparent all, okay. all the time. We don't have much time left, but uh, in a few minutes that we do have left, I want to touch on Syria. We've seen uh, the pictures from around the world, uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime crushing refugees. Uh, we're hearing the stories, uh, some is propaganda, some is real. Uh, humanitarian organizations from South Africa, from around the world, providing relief for these refugees. Um, you know, some of our, our local uh, in South Africa as well uh, went across to help these people and the stories that they render in masjids around the country uh, tell us of, of inflicting pain by regime. Um, your thoughts on it and how do we, uh, how can we as the Ummah, I'm not talking specifically South Africa, but around the world, work towards assisting those refugees and ensuring that this crisis finally and eventually comes to an end? The first point that I'd like to make is that uh, all the atrocities uh, are not the ones that have been committed by the regime's forces. I think the other side is equally to be blamed. They have perpetrated horrible crimes in slitting people's throats and ripping, you know, dead soldiers' bodies and eating their organs. I mean, this is the worst kind of behavior that, that one can, you know, imagine uh, coming from people that claim to be Muslims. This is sickening behavior. This has nothing to do with Islam. I don't hold any brief for Bashar al-Assad, but I want to emphasize that both sides are responsible, not only one side. Secondly, of course, as Muslims and as any human beings, we must always extend a helping hand to the refugees that are the victims of this vicious war. The third thing is that we have seen for three years this war has gone on. It has not brought any solution. I believe the only solution is a negotiated settlement and a diplomatic solution to this problem when all the parties that are represented in Syria will sit together and hammer out an agreement. And whatever agreement they come to, that is what everybody should accept because that would be a Syrian solution. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. We are speaking to Zafar Bashar. And like I said, there's a lot of issues that we need to discuss. I mean, every corner of the world, it seems as the world is at war with Muslims. Kashmir, Israel, America, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, it just never ends. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave these issues and discuss it in future episodes, inshallah, if Allah permits. We've come to the end of another edition of Perspective. You're welcome to interact with me by sending me a mail on faisal at itvnetworks.tv. Alternatively, send me a tweet on fazy143 or drop me a comment on facebook.com forward slash Fazal Patel. Uh, Zafar, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Inshallah, have, you, have a safe trip back to Canada. Thank, Thank you very much. From myself, Faisal Patel and the great team here at ITV fi amanillah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh unati al-haqq fi layl lahi min asdaq al-najwa wa ad'u Allah min qalb salim yatlubu at-taqwa unati al-haqq fi layl lahi min asdaq al-najwa wa ad'u Allah min Salim, you're a